Okay everyone, welcome to the second winter webinar, the delayed second winter webinar. Sadly, in classic 2020 style, our speaker Charlotte Ward from the Lloyd's Register Heritage and Education Centre uh, sadly was ill the day before the webinar and we had to cancel last minute. Luckily for us, uh, over the last couple of weeks she has pre-recorded it for us and without further ado, here is the frozen food revolution from Charlotte Ward and the Lloyd Register Heritage Education Centre. And welcome to uh, my presentation on the story of the SS Dunedin and the frozen food revolution. So my name is Charlotte and I am the Education and Outreach Coordinator at the Lloyds Register Foundation Heritage and Education Centre. And um, Citizen asked me to um, take part in their webinar series, which uh, and, and, and to pick a subject um, related to ships, boats, ferries, which, as you can imagine, working in a maritime archive, I had a lot of options um, to choose from and, and so many fantastic stories that appear in our collection. But I settled on the Dunedin um, because firstly, she's, she's one of my favourite ships in our collection. Um, and she also represents um, an incredible change, not only in maritime history and engineering and technology, but also in, in social and economic and even cultural history. And she's one of those um, ships and one of those parts of history that I don't think many people know about and is actually still has such an important relevance today. So. Um, so firstly, I just want you to talk through you know, the history of Lloyd's Register, who we are, what we did um, and why we exist. So up until um, the, the sort of, well, 1760, when Lloyd's Register was established, merchant ships were not inspected for safety, reliability or seaworthiness. So this meant that ships could travel around the world, different types of water, different um, weather conditions, all sorts of cargo, and actually not ever really knowing if their ship was 100% safe. This meant that, of course, cargo, lives and ships were lost um, quite frequently. So, what you have is, you know, you have insurance as an established practice. So after a ship was lost, it meant that, you know, the ship owner could, could claim on the insurance um, and that side of things is fine. But classification and ensuring the safety of ships was not. And it was this idea of, you know, what, what can they do to ensure that a ship before it goes anywhere is, is actually safe? So you um, enter Edward Lloyd's Coffee House and coffee houses in the 17th and 18th century were places where business was done. You didn't have an office, you went to a coffee house and certain coffee houses attracted a certain type of clientele. So Lloyd's Coffee House attracted those in the marine business. So in this coffee house, you have the establishment of Lloyd's of London, the insurance business. You also have Lloyd's List and finally you have Lloyd's Register. Uh, which, as I said, was set up in 1760. And this sort of group of men that set it up decided that what they wanted was um, ships to be surveyed and, and ensured for their safety, um, but also uh, to establish a register book where merchant vessels would be listed um, detailing the owners, the, the captains, the tonnage, the port belonging to and the destination, and of course, the all important classification. So on the screen here, you can see a page from the 1764 register book, the oldest known register book um, that survived and is in our collection. So you can see the, the varying types of detail that you get, and I'm sure you can probably pick out some, some places and some names, um, but in the, the all important last column is the classification. So a ship would be classed based on its hull and outfit, and it would be given a classification going from A, E, I, O, U, and then uh, a second one with good, middling, bad. So a ship that was A, G was the best, um, you know, could sail anywhere in the world, was that the, you know, surveyors were very happy with it. Um, others, maybe an E, G or an E, M, yeah, still good, but mainly recommend for shorter journeys or coastal uh, voyages. And then um, if your ship came back as UB, you probably might as well destroy it. Um, not worth the effort, really. 
Um, and eventually this classification system was, was simplified and, and changed to A1. And, and that's become a colloquial expression as well to mean great, everything's good. Um, and it meant that any ship had to be classed A1 or it would fail, which makes considerably more sense. So in the 1764 register book, uh, there were 4,118 ships um, and the most popular ship name was Nancy. Um, so then we have the kind of the development of Lloyd's Register. So it's set up in 1760 and, you know, what was its purpose and, and were people actually, you know, interested in, in getting their ships surveyed and, and classed? Because, of course, um, for a survey or the subscription to the register book, it cost money and was it necessary? But it was it was starting to develop this idea that actually it was, you know, if a ship owner wanted to sell their ship, the the potential buyers could go to the register books and go yep it's had a, a good classification all the way through its history we're happy that it's in the register book we'll buy it you know it's today it's like having a car and getting its mot or checking its uh, it, you know its service its mileage um and so on and so forth so it was becoming a, a a kind of a good idea and with that um lloyd's register then prided itself on its professionalism, its expertise, its knowledge and experience. So um, the surveyors who were initially just based in the UK, but then uh, eventually would be based overseas, they were um, usually ex-seafarers, ex-mariners, uh, naval architects, uh, you know, were in the Royal Navy. They were real experts in shipping and construction, um, and particularly ships built in the age of sail. So here we have some sort of images on the screen that um, highlight various aspects of, of Lloyd's Register's initial sort of work and, and, and as it continues today. So on the left, we have George Bailey throwing his briber overboard. Now, George Bailey was one of our earlier survey surveyors uh, from the early 19th century, um, and surveyors were paid considerably more than others of the same kind of training um, and experience that they were. Some were paid almost on the same levels as doctors and lawyers, um, despite not having it that formal education. They were paid a bit more so that they uh, were less likely to accept bribes. So we can see here that George Bailey, the, the true upstanding Lloyd's Register surveyor, who's who has a respect for his profession and the organisation, someone, a ship owner says, you know, I'll give you a bit of extra money if you let my ship um, be OK. And he throws his, his briber overboard because he will not accept the bribery. We then also have um, on the right uh, the uh, Lloyd's Register crest and the motto is without prejudice. So no matter where in the world Lloyd's Register went to survey ships, no matter who own the ships, um, they would class the ship based purely on its construction, its uh, outfit, its rigging, um, and that is, you know, they they stuck by their um, their agenda there. And then finally, in the middle, we have Lloyd's Rule, um, and also becomes the, the known as the Load Line or the Plimsoll Line. So again, because the society was set up in 1760 as a safety organisation. Everything they did was to ensure that the you know the marine world was safer. So this idea that overloading a ship would then cause um, it to sink, you know, that was something they were working on in the 1830s. And it's not until the later 19th century that the Plimsoll line really comes in to play and, and is passed through Parliament. So Lloyd's Register was working on that you know decades before to to find new ways of ensuring that ships were safe. And as we can see from these two photographs, of course, they're from much later than the um, than the you know, sort of where I was talking about around the 1830s. These are sort of back into the 1920s and 1930s. But we can see why it's so important to class and survey ships. You know, the, the damage that um, you know, has been caused to these ships is quite obvious from the from photographs. And we have quite an extensive photograph collection of various bits of ships everywhere, um, ships that have had a boiler blow up on them or have crashed or or have had, you know, something happen to their construction. This is why 
they they wanted to make sure that they were safe before they went. I mean, anything can happen to a ship while it's sailing, but just to ensure that for the most part, you know, the ship was safe and, and um, its construction was was sound. So no sooner had Lloyd's Register established itself in 1760 as a, a leading or trying to be a leading organisation in shipbuilding, construction um, and safety, then the Industrial Revolution hits. And this meant that Britain went through a monumental change. So everything from, you know, everything was analog, um, you know, ships were made of wood, sails, uh, people, you know, were working agriculturally, you know, there, were, there was trades that were handed down from generation to generation with very specific skills. Trade was was opening up anyway um, from around the world, but you still had very local trade. Suddenly this all goes 100 miles an hour and things change. So um, factories were built and this sped up production of materials uh, with new machines being installed. Things like canals were built. So here we have the Bridgewater Canal built in 1761. So produce could move faster and, and, and more efficiently. And new materials were being used as well, iron and, and steel. So this was an incredibly um, challenging time for, for everyone, but also this, um, you know, I, I can't imagine what it had been like to experience the Industrial Revolution and, and everything around you changing. So within the Industrial Revolution, you had those um, who were leading the way, you know, the inventors, those who were thinking outside the box and wanted to do things bigger and better and faster than ever before. So you had someone like Robert Stevenson with his famous rocket, you had Isambard Kingdom Brunel and his desire to build bigger, faster ships and, and bridges and, and all sorts of things. So you have those sorts of people that are really leading the way and pushing it. But then, you, of course, you had the, the other side, the, the fear and concern over the rate in which things were moving. So, for example, with railways, you know, the members of the, the public um, and, and politicians and, and so on either saw it as a, you know, it just wasn't going to last um, or were fearful that if they got on a train, their insides would fly about, um, that women might miscarry uh, their babies, um, or that they would stop breathing due to the speed that it was going. And then, of course, you've got how safe are these new materials and, and new methods of, of engineering? They they could be dangerous, you know, they're, they're, the lives are being lost. So they had all these kind of sides of things. And then you other, the other side you had was the fact that these new factories and, and machines and methods of engineering were taking jobs away from skilled labourers. You know, these labourers that had you know, taken on the family business and had passed down generations of skills and expertise. That was tough on them. And then also working in a factory, those conditions were extremely tough. So you have, for example, the Luddite movement that started in Nottingham, where they just went and smashed up machinery and, and campaigned against the, you know, these machines taking their jobs and their livelihoods. It was a very challenging time for a lot of people. And this, of course, then fed into Lloyd's Register. So shipping was one of those, um, shipping was one of the, the main industries that started to change and be revolutionised. So, um, you know, we 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 suddenly get this um, move from sail and wood to steam, and then to composite ships, and and then we have iron and steel. And in the middle of this, you have, of course, those shipbuilders that are wanting to to change the way shipping is is um, is done, to make it faster, to make it bigger, better. Um, you know, going everywhere in the world. And then you have Lloyd's Register saying, well, hang on, we don't know if these these, these materials are, are safe. We don't know if, if a steam engine is, is safe. We need to understand these developments in order to make sure that these ships are safe. So to take an example of this, I was going to, I'm going to focus on steam power. So um, the earliest steamer we, we know in the register book is a ship called the Woodford. Um, and she appears in 1818, um, built at Dumbarton, 
Remarkably, she made a voyage out to the West Indies, which was quite an achievement when steamers were so unreliable that they mainly stayed with coastal trade. Then we also have a ship called the Savannah the following year, and the Savannah sailed across the Atlantic. Again, quite a feat of, of uh, engineering. On the screen here, we have a steam, um, steam packet ship called the James Watt, um, and the James Watt was built in 1821, classed A1, owned by the Leith and Edinburgh Shipping Company, and was used at one point to tow King George IV's royal yacht, Royal George, into Leith in 1822. And you can see from the image that you've got the, the clear sort of paddle steam engine in the middle. But you've also, I'm sure, noticed is that there are still sails all over it. And we get this with a lot of early steam powered and even later steam powered ships. Because the steam engines were unreliable, ships still had to have sails so that if the steam engine went down, the um, ship would still be could still be powered. So it prevented it from being stuck at sea or or lost or, or anything. Um, and this was great. Uh, it seemed to work, but it did cause some problems. Um, you know, the reliability on two sources of power wasn't great. The um, steam engines weren't reacting well with wood. So it's thought, oh, great, maybe iron will help. But then with iron ships, you can't really have them over 5,000 tonnes and have sails. So there were some, you know, there was many, many teething issues. And um, Lloyd's Register, you know, is, is learning from... Um, from this. So the surveyors made the effort to go to shipyards that they were you know, working in anyway and learn about steam power. So this meant that rules could be written up in, the 18, in 1835 and in 1839 you had the uh, first section, first part of the register book that had a section called uh, Ships Navigated by Steam. Um, Surveyors made notes that, you know, if, if, a steam, if a ship was steam powered, they had to be surveyed at least twice a year due to the fact that, you know, they didn't know how successful they were going to be. And the steam engine did not form part of the ship's classification, which seems a bit counterintuitive, but we, we go with it. So here on the screen, we have a survey report for a steam vessel called the Giraffe, which we can see um, in the top and all the other details regarding the ship, so built in 1836, but this report is from 1845. So you can see that, you know, the ship has received its um, its, classific its survey, um, everything's good, sound, um, it's very efficient, um, and has received the classification A1. But because she was steam powered, there was a separate certificate for vessels navigated by steam. And this was just a certification to say that the engine has been looked over. Um, notes are made about it. It's got its certificate thereby. It's it's safe, um, but that um, it's still not part of the classification. The ship was able to get its classification not based on its engine. So we can see that LR is adapting to the change, but their reputation was on the line. Considering this is an organisation that set itself up with its level of expertise and experience and knowledge, it couldn't just say, oh yeah, that engine's great, that ship's great, um, because if anything happens, that's their business that would be um, come under scrutiny. So um, the 19th um, century, obviously, <laughs> progressed and um, the the steam engines started to be developed more um, and more different types of materials were being used so as I said it was trying steam powered iron still with sails without sails so you know a lot was was changing um, so then we have the you know LR trying to keep up with that as well um, and looking at new materials like iron. So the first rules for iron ships appeared in 1844, but there, there had been iron ships in the register books since about 1836. Notes were made on these, um, on these, uh, the register book entries about it being experimental, built of iron. So they were just always reiterating the fact that, you know, they weren't 100% about these ships. 
and there was still some schools of thought that iron and steam and everything wouldn't last. Um, and until you really get to the 1850s and 1860s, did people think and realise that actually, yep, yeah, this is this is the way forward. Um, so in 1853, the Visitation Committee at Lloyd's Register went to one of the yards on the River Clyde and said, came away with the impression of the, uh, came away with a deep impression of the rapidity with which iron was replacing wood. Um, so you can see that this, this change is really happening to Lloyd's Register um, and they're going to have to sort of get on board with it as it were. Um, so then we, we hit so the 1870s, um, 1873, the committee decided that it was no longer possible to class a steam vessel without ensuring the safety of the machinery. So it's taken them a few decades, but they finally realised that fact. Um, so the existing ship surveyors, again, many that were still more familiar with wood and sail, did hold their hands up and say, look, we, we, we don't have that expertise on steam power, on iron, on steel, whatever it might be. Um, and we can't therefore, you know, really guarantee the machines and engines safety. So Lloyd's Register um, decided that it would be it would be prudent to appoint a engineer surveyor. And here we have William Parker joining the society in 1874, and he later became the first chief engineer surveyor. So we can see, see him here, and then we can see um, a survey report on the machinery for a ship called Maria Pia from 1878. Um, so this was one that William Parker had had carried out, and you can see the detail in which now it's going into with regards to the engines and and the boilers. So Lloyd's Register um, by the 1870s, you know, this is where they were. They had learned, they had adapted their rules um, to include steam power, iron and steel was coming in. Um, they had started to engage different types of expertise with an engineer surveyor. So things were progressing and this is where they were by um, the in the 1870s. So to put Lloyd's Register into some wider context, um, with the Industrial Revolution, and the development of factories and, and the increase in, in urban population. This meant that there was, um, of course, um, the, the, the downsides to this. Um, poverty was on the rise, the population was growing at a considerable rate, um, and this in turn meant that food was becoming more and more scarce. So here we have uh, the image of uh, the young Oliver Twist, asking Mr Bumble for more food. Yeah, the famous police say, I want some more. And it does sort of highlight what was going on at the time. Um, so, you know, traditionally, Britain had relied on local fresh produce and, and non-perishable trade. So be it um, uh, you know, spices from overseas, but they might get local meat, local vegetables, dairy, you know, the farmers, uh, agriculture was, was such an important part of, of the British economy. So that was, was fine. But then with, with an increase in population, um, there were, you know, the food was becoming more and more scarce. So this idea of um, transporting meat in particular from around the world where there are other, you know, huge farmlands and, and different types of produce. That wasn't a new idea, you know, but the problem was getting the meat to survive long journeys and still be fresh. So mariners and, and those that served in the Navy were very familiar with, you know, having their meats salted, which was, which was great. Um, they might have a couple of of, of animals on board to be slaughtered at some point in the journey, but that would only be a, a few, not enough to feed a, a country. Then meat had been tinned, uh, tins and sorted and transported overseas. But this was really only available to the middle and upper classes due to the cost of, of tinned meat. So then it was, how do we solve this, this problem? And freezing meats and, and using refrigeration is, is sort of bounced about as a new idea. So 
historically and, and over the centuries, you know, on land, people could keep certain types of food at colder temperatures. You know, you might have an outhouse that's on, you know, underground to store food under there, make use of, of blocks of ice um, and so on and so forth. Um, and then to transport some types of food, initially it was thought, well, you know, if we travel through the colder months, through colder climates, then, then naturally everything will be colder, which works to some extent, but, but it's not reliable. Um, in 1875, the Americans did successfully deliver frozen meat to Britain. Uh, they used the, a cold bank that had coal-powered fans over large blocks of ice, but this was incredibly unreliable. So there were some early attempts. With regards to refrigeration on land, this was being this was considerably more successful. So in the 1860s, um, Thomas Sutcliffe, who we have here pictured with his wife, um, had set up Australia in Australia the world's first freezing plant um, at Sydney's Darling Harbour. So uh, they were able to keep produce cold, put it onto uh, railway carriages and send it off around the, the country. Great, works on land, perfect. But that was still the problem. How do they do it, oh, you know, overseas. So from this moment, from the, the 1860s to the 1880s, there was two decades of fierce competition about who was going to develop the first successful continuous um, refrigeration and, and frozen meat trade. So here we have some competitive freezing. So the initially there were there were several attempts to to start this in Argentina. Um, where the the meat business was a, was very lucrative, they saw the potential of it and enlisted French engineer Charles Tellier to install a form of refrigeration um, engine on the ship, the city of, city of Rio de Janeiro, in 1868. So this uh, they they were able to transport frozen beef um, to London, used ammonia, but the machinery broke down and, and ammonia, you know, it, it wasn't going to be a great long lasting solution to this problem. But it did start the it did continue to start the ball rolling um, with this development. Then in New South Wales, they uh, had a business that backed the steamship Northam, but it didn't wasn't successful at all, didn't didn't even leave port uh, because the ammonia reacted with uh, the iron on the ships. So not good. Then we have the French steamer Paraguay, and that uh, successfully delivered 5,500 frozen carcasses between Buenos Aires and Le Havre um, by ammonia compression. And then um, we have the enterprising Queenslanders, and they took the Lloyd's Register class steamship Strathleven, which we have a picture of here, and installed um, at the Bell Coleman refrigeration machinery. And I'll come on to Bell Coleman in a little bit. Um, and the Strathleven successfully delivered 50 tonnes of Australian beef and mutton to London, the very first to do so. So well done to the Strathleven. And it's great, you know, they've, they've used new type of machinery that worked. It was an incredibly historic voyage. Um, the problem was the Strathleven relied completely on speed. So they had took a shortcut um, through the Suez Canal um, and you know, th there was still that question of could the same be done, more, more meat, uh, keeping it frozen, but slower, not having to rely on speed so that they, the ship could eventually take various different routes around the world. But it was a good start. So then we come on to the Bell Coleman um, mechanic, the Bell Coleman Mechanical uh, Refrigeration Company. So in 1877, Henry and James Bell of the Glasgow Shipping Company, John Bell and Sons, approached uh, a chap called John, Joseph James Coleman, and they had a great idea. As um, he was a fellow of the Chemical Institute and um, was chosen for the task of developing um, refrigeration um, pro... Um, uh, developing a refrigeration process uh, that could successfully preserve frozen goods for long periods. So that was his his aim. 
So he was able to get a patent that same year and took the newly formed Bell Coleman Mechanical Refrigeration Company and their new um, engine to the um, to London's Naval and Submarine Engineering Exhibition. So the way it worked, and, and bear with me on the engineering technicalities and, and sciences, it's not my forte, but it relied on a compressor to draw air from an insulated cold chamber for compressing it, depositing it into an air cooler, um, and then to prevent high temperatures of dry compression, water is injected to cool the air. Then via a system of drying pipes to remove the moisture, the pressurised cooled air passes to a steam cylinder. The air is then expanded and the heat is deducted before finally passing back to the cold chamber where the cycle is repeated. So it's, it's, a, it's a process, but it works. So great. And, you know, the Bell Coleman, though it was, had been you know, set up and developed to, um, to deliver and transport cargo overseas, what um, it first ends up being used for is um, on land in slaughterhouses. And it was installed in refrigerated stores in places like Sydney, Bermuda and Auckland, um, which was great. It was working. So the, the Bell Coleman machine was was then installed on the Strathleven, worked great. But what needed to happen was this machine needed to be, to, needed to be combined with a very entrepreneurial business. And then um, in walks... Um, So what the, the Bell, Bell Coleman machine is there. So what we then need is the appropriate ship in which to um, take this machine and have this, this historic voyage. So enter the Dunedin, constructed for the Albion Shipping Company and built in 1874 at, Port, at the Port Glasgow shipyard of Robert Duncan and Co. She was an iron two-decked three-mast ship measured 242 foot um, and had a gross register tonnage of 1,320. She was originally um, used for the conveyance of emigrants to New Zealand and under Captain John Whitson, she had gained a really strong reputation for um, completing these voyages very quickly in sort of less than 100 days. Considering the fact that she is sail, and not steam, that was remarkable. So the Strathlevens voyage was, voyage was a success and it caught the attention of William Davidson, who was the director of the New Zealand and Australian Land Company. Um, they had a freehold of roughly 186 acres of farmland across New Zealand and Australia, and it was one of the largest meat and wool producers in the region. So they have a very, um, or he has a very vested interest in the success of a global meat trade. So after the investigation of the Bell Coleman and the Strathleven, Davidson persuaded the shareholders of the New Zealand and Australian Land Company to invest in this new technology. So he he got away with it and, and he picked the Dunedin um, because of her speed, of, of course, um, but also the fact that because she was a sail, there was not going to be any more space taken up by engines. You'll have the refrigerated engine, but you won't have the steam power engine. It's great, there's more space, be a bit lighter, you can put more produce on. Um, and she'd had a very successful proven track rec record of service between Britain and New Zealand. So it's great, all, all words. And, and you know, the name, of course, um, is synonymous with, with New Zealand, so very patriotic as well. It's perfect. Um, so the, uh, the Dunedin was refitted with the Bell Coleman uh, machine. And we can see here from her survey for repairs report dated um, 1881, that the surveyor makes a note that a uh, that she had been fitted with a Bell and Coleman refrigerating apparatus for the purpose of bringing dead meat from New Zealand to England. So it's noted in the survey report 
Um, the ship had always received A1, so the ship continued to receive A1, and the surveyor just, just made that note. Um, ships would have uh, surveys for repairs if they needed to be repaired or if they were going to be refitted in any which way. So this was very sort of the reason why the Dunedin had a survey of repairs. So all was good. She was delivered to Port Chalmers and from the 5th of December 1881, a herd of uh, Merino, Lincoln and Leicester crossbred sheep um, from the uh, New Zealand and Australia land companies uh, land uh, were slaughtered for the purpose um, of this voyage. So they were delivered to the ship, put into bags and frozen on the ship. And then to prove that the process of the freezing had worked, the frozen carcasses were taken off of the ship, thawed out and, and cut. So um, it showed that, yep, the freezing process worked great. A week later, however, a crankshaft in the compressor broke and the and, and hundreds of the carcasses were lost. Though they were then given to locals, thawed out and, and used, sold, eaten. And again, they said the quality of the meat was, was still great. So it took a month or so for the rebuild. Um, but then on the 15th of February, 1882, the Dunedin sailed with 4,301 cuts of mutton, 598 cuts of lamb, 22 pig carcasses, 250 kegs of butter, hare, pheasant, turkey, chicken, and 2,226 sheep tongues. So quite a cargo um, to take overseas. Um, on the, the journey, there were some issues. Um, one of the biggest being that when the vessel sailed through the tropics, the crew noticed that cold air in the hold was not circulating properly. So to save his cargo, Captain John Whitson went above and beyond. He crawled inside the machinery and was able to put extra air holes in to ensure the circulation of air. He almost froze to death in the process, but luckily it had a rope um, put around him and the crew pulled him out before he, he froze. Um, so that it really is going above and beyond for your ship and your cargo. So the, the destination was Smithfield in London. And in 1855, the Metropolitan Cattle Market, which you can see pictured here, had opened. Um, but this meant that parts of uh, West Smithfield, Smithfield were a waste ground. And then a new market was constructed uh, following the 1860 Metropolitan Meat and Poultry Market Act um, of Parliament. Um, the permanent buildings that were around were designed by the architect Sir Horace Jones, who also designed Billingsgate and Leadenhall. Um, so this is the destination, this very busy, um, popular meat market, of course, that had been dominated by local produce, local beef, lamb, mutton, all sorts of things. And for the first time, some cargo from overseas was going to come into the market. Um, so not only be foreign, but also have been through a freezing process that nobody knew anything about. So you can imagine there was some scepticism and um, issues surrounding what was about to arrive at Smithfield Market. So 98 days later, um, after she left New Zealand, um, the Dunedin arrived and the meat was transported to Smithfield Market to be sold over a fortnight by John Swan and Sons. So he's noted again all those sort of concerns, the quality of the meat, the fact it was coming from overseas, all of those problems. He, he was skeptical that it would sell. However, um, no sooner had the meat been put on the market than people did realise it was still good quality and was um, had was far superior over previous attempts at freezing meat and, and transporting it, and also against some of the more local produce, which may have rubbed some people up the wrong way. Um, only one carcass was condemned out of everything, which was very, very successful. Um, and it was noted in the um, New Zealand Herald at the end of 1882, that New Zealand was as much a province of England, as easy a source of supply for the London market as Yorkshire or Devon. 
Again, not sure how many people um, in Yorkshire or Devon would agree with that, but it does go to show that the the meat trade had just opened up and, and this whole new world was was out there. The um, the company that, that that led the charge here, they made a profit, so they were happy. Um, and it meant that New Zealand and Australia could become world leaders in the refrigerated meat industry. So the Dunedin sister ship, the Marlborough, was brought into the trade. Um, then you also have other rival companies buying ships and converting them. And so within five years, you had 170, 172 shipments of frozen meat going from New Zealand to the UK. And only nine of those really had any significant amounts of meat condemned. It was a really successful um, venture. Um, so Lloyd's Register, of course, had to um, keep up uh, with the changing world. And it was decided after several years um, that the rules for refrigeration machinery would be introduced in 1898, due to the fact that there was a lot of unregulated shipping going on. That was fine. Rules came in in 1898. They were drawn up by Robert Balfour, um, who was the society's first appointed refrigeration engineer. They would then, the ship would then receive a refrigeration machinery certificate and have the notation plus RMC. So it was first awarded to the Blue Anchor Line steamer Wakul, which we have pictured here. Um, and it was also deemed acceptable that even if the ship hadn't been classed by Lloyd's Register and had maybe been classed somewhere else, the freezing plant and machinery could be classed by Lloyd's Register and receive the um, Lloyd's Register certification. Um, which was, was great, you know, and, and then the business continued to boom. So by the outbreak of the First World War, over 40% of meat consumed in the United Kingdom had been imported. Um, you know, and it also offered things outside of meat, poultry and, and dairy, but exotic fruits and vegetables that could be enjoyed all year round rather than seasonal, which had always been the case. Um, then you have the Empire food ships of the 1930s and economies like those of Australia and New Zealand were really leading the way with this. You know, they they were firmly established, established as agricultural world leaders in this trade. Um, and then after the Second World War, there um, was further developments of insulation, um, minimising the loss of, of chilled air. In 1968, you have um, two ships uh, of the port line, the Port Caroline and the Port Chalmers, um, and they were the largest refrigerated cargo ships afloat, measuring over 16,200 GRT. Considering the fact that the Dunedin was 1,300 GRT, that is an incredible um, difference in size in less than a hundred years. You know, this this is well, this was where shipping was was going. And then in, in today, today and age, you know, with containerization, um, over a hundred million tons of frozen cargo can be carried per year. And think about that when you go to the supermarket, when you you buy food for your Christmas dinner this year or anything else. You know, you're often you'll pick up things that are from overseas that are not seasonal or that have been frozen, um, you know, from from New Zealand, from Australia, from wherever in the world. And it's thanks to the innovation that surrounded the Bell Coleman refrigeration uh, machinery and the 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 Dunedin. Um, so the Dunedin um, continued with a few more voyages. Um, but was going to be overtaken by further developments in, in shipbuilding and construction. Unfortunately, she was mysteriously lost in 1890 with 35 hands aboard. Um, no one knows really what happened to her or, or, or where she is. But uh, unfortunately, a really tragic end to a remarkable ship. Um, she had achieved so much um, and it was written that the ship that has accomplished a feat which must long have a place in commercial, indeed in political annals, is the Dunedin, belonging to the Albion shipping line. Um, and that's really her story, this, this remarkable period of our history, of global history as well. This, this isn't just British history, this is world history 
um, that is such an incredible story and has had such an impact on our lives today, on trade, on the economy, on society. Really, really important. Okay, I think the last word there was important. A uh, big thank you to Charlotte Ward and the Heritage Education Centre for getting that over to us. Uh, recording was a little short, but no worries. I think we can all work out that last word. Okay, and thank you all for joining us, and please tune in to the next Winter Webinar.